qualities that we ought to put on. One of the things is that we put on wisdom and teaching and let the word of God dwell in us and that we teach one another in song. We have a verse here that's parallel to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, uh, which was written at about the same time as this book and delivered about the same time. Um, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So we have a, a command to let the word of Christ richly dwell within us, abide within us and control us and be the guiding uh, principle in our life is what God's word has to say. We want to communicate that with all wisdom. Um, we need to be uh, knowledgeable of all the things that God's word teaches and be able to present it in an acceptable way, a tactful way to others, uh, and also admonish one another, warn one another, uh, set one another on the right uh, path. And all of these things should be accomplished with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So as we ended class last week, they, they were a singing church in the New Testament. And they taught their members in song, and we all recognize that's a very effective way to cause thoughts uh, to, to get stuck in your head is through songs. We use it, uh, I guess you'll remember songs from grade school. Uh, singing the school song, I still remember Washington is the best. It's <laughs> Washington Grade School. So uh, uh, we, we have things that stick in our head and uh, through singing, and God uses that technique to uh, instill spiritual thoughts and warnings in our minds so that we'll be able to call these things to mind in time of need and temptation. Uh, and uh, we see one of the characteristics, we mentioned this quote, uh, uh, Pliny, the governor of Athenius, in a report to Trajan about Christians. He wanted to know about how to enforce the law that outlawed Christianity. And uh, he pointed out they don't do anything bad, these Christians. They meet and sing a hymn to Christ as God. One of the things they do. They bind each other under oaths not to do anything unlawful or hurtful or whatever. So basically, Trajan told them, well, don't seek them out, but Somebody confesses they're a Christian, then you have to deal with them. Uh, pretty sad. Um, so it's a God's de demise, uh, devised means or designed means to get these thoughts in our head. We must uh, bring the thoughts and feelings of the heart into harmony with the sentiment of the psalm. So uh, we need to sing, like Paul says in 1 Corinthians, with the understanding. We need to know what we're singing. We need to speak the words in an understandable way so that the message of the song gets across. Uh, that's the most important part of the song. It? It's not so much uh, how wonderful we are at the performance, but are we getting the message across to each other? Are we, are we communicating the wisdom and the warnings across in the songs as we sing them? So... We have to sing with the spirit and the understanding. And the thoughts in the songs are, are to be derived from the scripture. This uh, teaching and admonishing it comes from having the word dwell in you. And uh, they're spiritual songs. They have their, their origin with the Holy Spirit's teaching. And they address human spirits. And so they have a nature in which we're trying to, uh, through the words of the songs, preach the gospel. Encourage one another to be obedient to God and uh, exalt God. So it's all it's all about uh, the teaching. It's one of the uh, major parts of why we sing is to communicate teaching. So we need to be sure that the songs uh, are accurate, right? I mean, we need to be careful that we sing scriptural songs. It might be good sometimes. For song leaders, if there's a very highly figurative song that you can take the wrong way, maybe you better say, okay, now this is talking about this. This is the scriptural way to look at this. That this is the proper way to sing this song. Uh, we take songs 
worship. Some of our songs come from all different kinds of uh, denominational people. And it can easily, you can take the wrong the, the song the wrong way sometimes. So anyway, we have to be sure that we have a scriptural song and we're communicating scriptural thoughts as we are admonishing one another. So Psalms uh, are of David. Uh, other writings of the book of Psalms. Many of our songs in our song books are found in the book of Psalms and have been you know, put to rhyme and so on. Um, hymns, songs of praise, spiritual songs, again, describes the content of the Psalms and that they're in harmony with the Holy Spirit's revelation that affects man's spirit for his edification, his spiritual moral upbuilding is what these songs should do. And it shows that not all singing is permissible in worship. So because it's a song doesn't mean we're supposed to sing it has to be a spiritual song, spiritual song. All uh, singing is to be accompanied with a thankful heart. So in all things that we do, the melody in our heart comes from gratitude for what God has given to us. None of us deserve to be saved. None of us can save ourselves. We can only be saved by God's grace that he has delivered to us in the teaching of the gospel. And by obedience to the gospel. And so we're always thankful in all things that we do. In all the songs that we sing. We're to be singing with gratitude for all the good gifts God gives us. And thanks is of course God's due. Uh, all of us owe him our life and breath and every good thing that we have. Comes from God. None of us would exist without God. Or be able to support ourselves without all of the designs that he's put into this world to bless us. So, especially Christians that have been saved by the blood of Christ need to sing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So, the purpose of the singing and worship is to praise God and teach others. Uh, there is a command specifically given to sing. We can put up a chart with every verse that talks about music in the New Testament. Every single one of them would have it is specified that you're to sing. But that's the kind of music that God has authorized he's commanded a certain kind of music in the church and once he specified what he wants it eliminates all other options it's like if you specify you know buttermilk is what you're supposed to buy when you get to the grocery store it rules out every other kind of milk if you specify singing is the kind of music that you want it rules out instrumental music it is the other kind you have instrumental accompaniment to the singing in the church, it's wrong because God has specified what he wants. Uh, there was much instrumental music available in the first century just like there is now. If God had wanted people to play and have instrumental accompaniment, it would have been easy thing. It went on in the temple. They had instruments of the temple in the Old Testament. And uh, it was a, a big part of their secular songs that they sang, but was recognized that in the church when you worship it's about teaching and admonishing one another with singing was what God wanted so it was unauthorized in the church again it would hinder the conveying of thoughts and sentiments um, to the heart if you've got instruments drowning out the words of the song you can see why God would specify that it ought to be singing without any accompaniment it would hinder and divert the mind from the words and the thoughts of the psalm. Um, you know, somebody takes a break, the guitar solo or whatever, that is not accomplishing God's purpose. It takes away from the singing of the psalm. So God has a purpose in why he uh, developed things in the way he does. So he conveys thought, it hinders, uh, diverts the mind. It aids, uh, perform, uh, it aids performance, maybe, to have instruments, I suppose, but not the service of God. But, well, it sounds better, or we like it better, if you have instruments, that doesn't have anything to do with it. It's what does God's service require, and what is his purpose? Bringing in the instrument impugns the wisdom of God. We know in the first seven centuries of the church, they did not have instrumental music. So this isn't just uh, some opinion that I've got. It was the view and the practice of all of the early Christians. 
that you don't have instrumentation. That's just a matter of history. It's in every encyclopedia about uh, you look up music in the church, and they'll, all of those encyclopedias will say the same thing. It's not a church of Christ doctrine that somebody today came up with. It's just the facts of history. They did not use instrumental music. And uh, if God uh, chose to leave it off and wanted to specify just the singing, then who's smarter than God? Who's going to tell God that he's wrong and that we need to add it in? That'd be the better thing to do. Um, it corrupts the service and perverts the ends and purposes of God when you change things and add things. Uh, instrumental music occupies a lead position in time and sound uh, when you ha have it introduced. Uh, so just a fact. Uh, the first instrument in worship among prof uh, professors of Christ was not introduced until the seventh century. It caused so much division, they took it out. And a couple centuries later, they brought it back. When Protestant denominations began breaking away from the Roman church, none of them used instruments. They were all just a cappella singing. But then gradually over time, they brought it in. And it usually caused division when they brought it in. Uh, so melodies to be made in the heart. We're told about the instrument that we're to play. And the instrument is the heart. That's where... The melody is to come from, not from a piano or a, or a trumpet or a horn of some kind. So Paul lays down a general rule for Christian conduct then in verse 17, the next verse. Does anybody else have any uh, comments on, on uh, the singing and teaching of one of Yes, Ben. This is uh, where that word another singing and uh, teaching and admonishing one another, something that we all do at the same time. Well, we're doing it uh, mutually. Of course, these acts of worship uh, aren't something that somebody else can do for you. When it comes to uh, prayer, we're all saying amen. We'll make that prayer our, our prayer. We have to do our own listening uh, to make sure that the words that are being taught are scriptural in a sermon. Nobody else can do the listening for us. We have to do the listening for ourselves. And we are all to be doing the singing and the teaching and admonishing and song. So it's not a, a, again, a performance that we come to watch, but we're all offering up service and sacrifice of lips to God. And we all have equal part to play in offering up those songs. So again, that's an innovation of men to you know, have some a lead or special group of singers uh, do the singing for us or entertain us. It wasn't the practice in the New Testament church to have that kind of distinction uh, made. So being careful about how we worship God in song is no different than anything else. Paul lays down a principle, whatever, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So tell us whatever we whatever we do, we need to have the authority of the Lord behind what we do. So we have a general rule for conduct in all of our singing and worship and in our uh, moral practice. We need to make sure that when we speak words or we do deeds, that we're able to do them in the name of the Lord, that the Lord would authorize them, that he'd approve of them, that we could do them in his name. If you do something in the name of someone as to do it by their authority or as their representative or as if it belongs to them. So do you speak words that could belong to the Lord? That are authorized by the Lord? Are your deeds in harmony with what the Lord teaches? What He would authorize? What He would be willing to own? Uh, we always have to ask the question. Well, 
and I do this in the name of the Lord. Everything we do in word or deed should be done with the Lord's authorization. And there are many different areas of our life that we uh, are responsible for. And in all things, we want to do them in a way that's fitting in the Lord's sight, fitting for a Christian to do, uh, someone that belongs to Jesus Christ. And uh, looking at this verse, uh, we should use not only the kind of language or engage in the kind of actions that Jesus approves in his word and by his life. We are to represent his teaching and cause to other people so that when they see the way we live, they see the kind of life that the Lord Jesus uh, teaches us to live and that, that he approves of. They should see in our words and action as individuals and as a congregation, only those things that Christ would consider as belonging to him. So we know in the Old Testament that when David committed adultery, the prophet told him that. He caused God to be blasting from the nation because he had acted the right way as God's king. And same is true with us. Uh, in Romans 2, it tells about the Jews causing the Gentiles to blaspheme because they professed the law, but they didn't keep the law. Same thing's true of Christians. If we proclaim Jesus as Lord and we don't follow what he teaches in word and deed, then it brings dishonor on the Lord. So whatever we do, we want to make sure that it puts the Lord first, that we, we're honoring his authority and his name. Um, so just based upon this principle, we shouldn't teach any doctrine that's not a part of Christ's doctrine. It comes to our teaching. And is that what Second John 9 said? If anyone goes too far, does not abide in the teaching of Christ. He does not have God. He who abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. We ought to refuse, uh, we have many that refuse to be restricted by Christ's authority and leads to doing things in word or deed by somebody else's authority. If you're not doing it in Jesus' name, then you're doing it in somebody based on somebody else's authority, maybe yours. I'm doing it on my own authority. I'm going to do this or that or say these kind of words or do these kind of deeds uh, based upon human tradition or commandments. Told in, in Matthew 15 9, but in vain do they worship me, teaching as their doctrines the precepts of men. So, if you're basing everything on the traditions of men or men's things, so in religion, it's vain. It doesn't do any good. Uh, engaging in lawless deeds or works of iniquity, having no authority from Christ. He says, Depart from me, all you who practice lawlessness. People saying, Oh, Lord, Lord, and yet you don't do the things the law says and the Lord says, that's lawlessness. Now we're commanded to do all things in the name of Christ. It shows Christ has complete authority over our lives. And certainly this verse, I think, completely demonstrates that. that whatever we do, we want to make sure the Lord is pleased that he authorizes this kind of behavior. Any other thoughts on... Uh, the first part, at least, of verse 17 here. Anybody else to add on that? And then it says, giving thanks through him. Well, who is the him? Uh, that pronoun goes back to the uh, personal, pronoun, uh, personal uh, noun right before that, Jesus. Giving thanks through him, through Jesus. God the Father. So through the means or agency of Christ is who we give thanks through. He's our mediator, right? He's the one that there's the one that gives us access to the Father. Uh, it allows us to approach God, to give thanks continually to God. It's in the present tense. Giving thanks. The ongoing thing as we live our life do our deeds, speak our words. We're always living as grateful, thankful people that express that uh, to God in prayer. Uh, we do it through Christ. So it shouldn't be just uh, you know, words that we ignore or we don't think about when anybody leads a prayer and we say through Jesus' name we pray. It's only through him that we're able to approach God 
and to give thanks. And we acknowledge that in our prayers. So Christ is our mediator. We pray through his name. He's our access to the Father. And of course, our gratitude is for redemption. It should be a constant uh, attitude and driving force in our lives that we have been saved even though we don't deserve it. Our works are polluted uh, by sin, and yet the Lord, through Christ's blood, forgave us. He continues to forgive us. As we go to him in prayer and confess our sins, he keeps on forgiving us. So every day we need to be grateful for our standing and our hope. Any other thoughts on the last part of the verse? Here's Jesus Christ. Then uh, we have a new section that begins, chapter 3, verses 18, through chapter 4, and verse 1, about the duties of husbands and wives, and then slave, or children, parents and children, and, and slaves and masters, just like in the book of uh, Ephesians. Uh, that section, parallel section, is found in Ephesians chapter 5, and then uh, the first part of chapter 6. So we have... Uh, other verses that are parallel to this. Of course, Peter has a section in 1 Peter where he has these same uh, exhortations, very similar to these. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. And do not be embittered against them. So, husband and wife relationship is talked about. We have uh, the Apostle Paul's statement here as an inspired messenger of Jesus Christ to the church who tells us what our duties are in the home and wives are to be subject to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord so, to be subject is to obey and, uh, a lot of people come to you we do a, a wedding ceremony they want to make sure I don't know I haven't heard as much lately I guess it's pretty much been expunged from uh, wedding ceremonies because of women saying this, but I don't want the word obey in it. So be subject has to do with obey. Uh, what that has to do with, so you can take it out of the wedding vow, but it's still in God's word, it's still part of the duty that is expressed here in Colossians 3, 18 to be subject, to be under the power, authority, uh, right and power to command and force laws uh, determinations of another. The Bible teaches wives to be subject to their husbands from the beginning to the end of the Bible. It's not something you can't really be a gospel preacher or a Bible teacher if you leave this out. I mean, it goes from Genesis 3.16 uh, all the way through to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. All of those teach the same thing, have the same command that's associated with them. So, Subjection is fitting in the Lord, is what, what it says, in the home. It's in harmony with the Lord's will. Fitting means suitable to, appropriate to the Lord's purpose. F.F. F. Bruce, in his common, Greek uh, commentary on Colossians, says the Stoics regularly refer to the ethical duties as the things that are fitting in the Lord. It suggests that the wife's obedience to her husband should go side by side with their obedience to the Lord. The phrase occurs four times in Colossians and 49 times in Paul's writings. In the Lord, fitting in the Lord. It sums up a relationship existing between fellow members of Christ, a relationship in which uh, does not supersede earthly relationships, but takes them up and lifts them up to a higher plane. We don't just do them for earthly reasons. We do what we do because it's fitting to the Lord when it comes to obedience. Now, here's the word, be subject, from the Greek dictionary. It's made up of two words. The pupo, paso, is uh, pupo like we get hypodermic needle. Shoot it underneath the skin, right? So it's a word under. The preposition under. Under and arrange. You arrange yourself under somebody else. All of us, unless I guess you're the absolute king, even he is under God, right? So everybody's under somebody. I've been under somebody my whole life. I've been subject to the government, subject to my parents, subject to my coaches or teachers or 
whatever. We're all subject. And the idea that it's a dirty word if you mention the order in the home uh, it's, doesn't apply every other other place you use it uh, to place or rank under to subject it's used in the middle mood you know, we have uh, active active mood where you talk about somebody you know you're causing the action to take place or passive something's happening to you in the Greek, they have the middle where you're doing something to yourself. And that's what this is talking about. The, the husband's not like grinding his wife under. She's willingly, because of the law of Christ, subjecting herself is what it means. She is to subject oneself to obey, to submit to one's control, or submit in the sense of voluntarily yielding in love, to yield to one's admonition or advice. There's a sense in which when you start the context of this in Ephesians, he said, be subject one to another. So in our relationship as Christians to one another, we're subject to one another. We voluntarily yield to other people, giving us advice and admonition. So wives uh, practice subjection because it's her duty to the Lord. It's part of our religious duty to obey the commands that the Lord gives us. Uh, he created her, God did, to be a help to her husband, uh, help me, or a help that's suitable. It's the reason Eve was made in the beginning, we read in Genesis, to help him meet his needs and be a companion for her husband. Uh, subjection is good work. That pleases God, it glorifies God. And since it does that, it ought to make it something that you do willingly that you're happy to do uh, that you uh, have great respect for the lord and you want to serve him in every different area of your life in a way that pleases him so she's to obey her husband unless he requires her to violate god's will or not to obey god or obey god rather than men is what peter told the same so even if the government or the king tells you to do something contrary to the will of christ like, don't teach the gospel. That's what they told them. They said, we must obey God rather than men. You can beat us and throw us in jail, but we're going to still teach the gospel. So there is spiritual equality. It's not a matter of uh, people not, not being uh, equal, men and women. They are equal. As far as their uh, nature and, and their uh, spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ are exactly the same. The rewards in heaven are exactly the same. But there is an order of authority uh, in this world. And, the, you know, in, the, in almost any institution you want to talk about, there's an order of authority in this human world that we live in. And it's the same way in the home. There's an order of authority in the home. There's a hierarchy of authority fixed by God. God is the head of Christ. They are equal in nature. But God the Father uh, has authority over the Son. I don't understand all about that. But that's a fact that's revealed to us. And when it comes to the whole man, the man is the head of a woman, it says in 1 Corinthians. Uh, to do otherwise is to go contrary to the nature of God's purpose in creation and her body was taken out of adam's that's what we're told in the beginning her name is taken from the man he's called ish she's isha and she was taken out of a man it says there in the hebrew uh, submissive wives bless their husband they exert gracious powerful beneficial influence on them for their good and uh, we all heard the sayings that are old sayings because they're true that behind every successful man there's a good woman and that has been uh, proven as a truism because it's true that uh, they work as a team and it helps both of them have success in god's design in the marriage uh, the greek and gentile opinion of women at the time that this book was written they thought that uh, certainly women were inferior and that they were not even good enough to be a companion, sort of the attitude of that pagan world. So this 
teaching in the New Testament, what people lose sight of is how they've been exalted with them by saying they are equal in Christ Jesus. They are equal spiritually. And they certainly are the very best person to have as a companion and a helper in life. Um, again, Galatians 3, verse 28, there is no distinction in Christ Jesus. Any other thoughts on verse 18? I know that there's uh, all the women's lib that's been taught since the 60s. And uh, we run across even young people today that want to get up and walk out the door for reading that passage, talking about that passage. Uh, and if we suddenly got smarter than God, I guess, since 1960, God doesn't know anything. Got to throw that out, change that verse. Well, if, if, if he's wrong on that one, then I guess he could be wrong on all of them, right? You can't just take part of the doctrine of Christ. You've got to take the same thing. You're going to respect him and follow him. Then the husband has special duty and responsibility in the home. Uh, husbands, love your wives. Do not be embittered against them. Husband should love his wife. Should love her as a sister in Christ. She is a fellow heir of the, of the kingdom, a fellow heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Love is to moderate the husband's exercise of his authority, decide how he uses his authority in the home. It is regulated by agape love, as talked about there. The final decision lies with the husband, but love is to guide him in reaching that decision. He's to act in the best interest of everybody in the home. Put their interests first in the way that he exercises his authority, just like Christ does toward us as head of the church. That leaves a lot of great room there for mutual deliberation and gentle persuasion uh, on decisions that need to be made. I'm trying to act in the best interest of my wife and my children and my home. I've got to take into consideration what my wife thinks about it. She knows more about her interests than I do. And what would be the best way to act? What's the best decision to make? And, uh, you want to bring in the best advice and information you can get on make, using your authority. Agape is the love that acts in the best interest of the object you love. Uh, Lenski, in his commentary on Colossians, says that uh, agape is intelligent and purposeful love, which goes beyond mere affection. F.F. F. Bruce says it involves the husband's active and unceasing care for his wife's well-being. The husband is to promote the good, happiness, and welfare of his wife, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So that doesn't sound like this... Uh, these are the response if you uh, mention a wife should be subject to her husband. A lot of young ladies have said, I've heard it over the years. Well, that doesn't mean I've got to be a slave. Does it sound like a slave master? The Lord's talking about as a husband. The husband is supposed to love his wife, act in her best interest, and try to promote her good in every way he possibly can. So it doesn't sound like slavery. But that's, that's the way the Word of God gets twisted uh, when people don't want to acknowledge its teaching. Uh, to love her in spite of how she might respond. Isn't that the way the Lord loved, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son? Christ loved us so much he laid down his life for us. And so a husband ought to be willing to lay down his life for his wife, we're told in Ephesians. You try to win her with love and overcome uh, evil with good. Love his wife as Christ loves the church. Uses authority for the good of his wife to feed, to nourish, and care for her as the head cares for his body. Uh, we have a principle that we operate on that this love teaches us to overcome evil with good. Agape gives. It invests. It acts first. And say, well, she wasn't nice, so I don't have to love her. That's not what the command is. You love your wife, whether she's nice to you or kind to you or not. 
you're to love your wife. And try to bring love out of everybody in your family. It's a sacrificial love and an understanding love. We're given a command that our prayers will be hindered unless we live with our wives in an understanding way. So our spiritual relationship with Christ depends on whether we love our wives with this agape love that is talked about here in this commandment. So it's a big order that is given to the husband to act in the proper way in the home. Then he switches from the positive um, love, and in this passage is different than what you have in Ephesians. It doesn't flip it around and look at the other side of it or what might be a, the negative consequences of a lack of love. He says, and do not be embittered against them. Not to be embittered against his wife. A lot of bitterness in, in homes and marriages and in family relationships that we see all around us. Uh, to be embittered, the Greek word means to make bitter, uh, literally, you know, to make something taste sour and uh, offensive or whatever. But then it's used figuratively of exasperate, to be irritated, be rendered resentful, sharp, cruel, severe, caustic, sarcastic. When you look up the word in the English dictionary, uh, what are the, to be embittered or to be full of bitterness? Well, that's what you, that's the kind of uh, synonyms that you have. It applies a deep-seated anger that smolders without catching fire. Uh, not to be filled with resentment toward our mate. Allow ourselves to be embittered. Oftentimes the word embittered is used uh, among the Greeks and in English to talk about someone that we consider inferior and we have resentment toward them, bitterness toward them. Um, to have instead, 1 Peter 3.17 says we are to have consideration, live with them in an understanding way, uh, as with the weaker vessel, treat them with honor and respect. Consideration. So each in the home should seek the benefit of the other. That's what we find in Proverbs 31 and verse 12 about that uh, excellent woman that she uh, looks well to the ways of her household. And that um, is one that blessing her household. And so should the husband, the wife, physically, culturally, and most importantly of all, the first priority ought to be that we're looking out for the spiritual well being of our wife. Her soul is, is good and right. Um, any other thoughts on verse 19? Big order. Oh, five minutes. Well, let's look in at uh, children and their fathers. Chapter 3 and verses 20 and 21. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children, that they may not lose heart. Well, commands are given to the parent-child relationship, just as in Ephesians. Uh, disobedience to parents is a pagan vice. It's one of those qualities that's found in the pagan world upon which uh, the judgment is going to fall, is that they are disobedient to Parents, that's put in among that list of horrible depravity that's talked about among the Romans. A practice of wickedness that's going to be evident at the last day, which we studied in our class in the back on 2 Timothy 3 2. In the last days, people are going to be disobedient to parents. It's one of the sins listed there, among with other vices. The word in command to be. Obedient, you can see that hoopa in the beginning of the word, under, like with subjection, and then it's joined with the word here, here under somebody. Uh, to listen, to attend to, to hearken to a command, to obey, to be obedient to, submit to, readiness to hear and carry out the instructions given by one who has the right to command. And it's in the present tense, be obedient. Not just once, but all the time. Habitually, um, keep on obeying what your parents uh, have to say as long as you're living in subjection to them. Like 
guys, there's a time when you'd leave your father and mother and be joined to your mate and form your own family. But while you're subject to your parents, you habitually obey their commandments. You're to hear under them what they command, teach. Um, in all things, that kind of adds power and weight to be obedient. <laughs> Now, that, that should have been enough, but he says in all things, he, he puts that, adds that on. In, in work or play or religious matters or social, whatever it is, be obedient to your parents. Listen. Faithfully carry out what is required so peace and harmony might prevail in the whole so that you might have a long life, Paul throws in in Ephesians, right? He says it's the first commandment in the law of Moses. With a promise, when you go through the Ten Commandments, if you honor your father and mother, you'll live long on the earth. The general rule for your uh, your life, you should be obedient to those that know more than you do and care about you and that are interested in your well-being. Uh, you want the home environment to contribute to the good and happiness of every member in it. And there needs to be a line of authority that's respected in the home. Children should obey their parents. Uh, it's well pleasing, acceptable, highly gratifying, and satisfying to the Lord to see children obey their parents. I have no greater joy than this to see uh, my children walking in the truth, is what John said. He's talking about spiritual children. <laughs> it's true of all children, isn't it? That's a beautiful thing. It makes the Lord glad, it gives him enjoyment, satisfaction. We have to understand the very opposite of that would be true if you did something like that. Grieve the Lord to see that kind of behavior. So we want to raise our children to respect authority and to listen and to do the right thing as, as God commands. Make it easy for them to do so. Fathers, do not exasperate your children that they may not lose heart. So father, the word their pattern is male ancestor and father of a, your corporal nature, uh, do not exasperate. Literally means to stir up. But here it's used in a bad sense. It means to stir up by provoking them or irritating them or incite resentment in them. So you don't have to be a bully as a father. You don't have to be somebody that's, uh, that, that causes your children to be righteously angry at you. Because you don't behave right as a father. You use your authority in the way that the Lord says to use it. Lest they lose heart. Well, it's the word for uh, dishearten, this spirit, break in spirit, be without spirit, become sullen, listless, demoralized, discouraged, come to think it's useless to even try to please the person. We'll have to come back and look at that in more detail, Lord willing.